Please welcome Mr. Hudson Mohawk. Hello. Yo, 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 yo. How you doing? No Tired, good. Yeah. Yeah. What well, what do we just what do we just open with? Um that is a Kanye West song called Blood on the Leaves, which is one of the first productions I did with him and basically we we're gonna have a discussion today about like how we went from the very early days of playing to like fifty people to to uh, you know working on this this type of material. So that basically. So tell us about those early days. Tell us about like where you're from and uh, what your first club culture experiences were that went on to inform the music that you've been making right up to now. Because I know that's a really important part of who you are. Yeah. So um, I'm from Glasgow in Scotland, um, and it was, you know, it's somewhere where there's not really a huge, um, there's not really a huge amount of hip hop culture. It's mainly electronic music, mainly house and techno. Um, so we, we were running these little nights, myself and, and uh, Callum, <laughs> um, who uh, we were running these small nights, which were, I mean, essentially like, kind of open mic night uh with where I would be like just DJing instrumentals for like local local rappers, whatever. And um from playing a bunch of instrumentals that got me into production and you know, that that kind of sparked my interest in the whole the whole idea of being a producer in general because before that I was just purely focusing on DJing and and a uh, you know turntablist type shit mm -hmm. yeah and tell us about your background as a turntablist because it wasn't <laughs> it it was a bedroom hobby wasn't it but it went yeah, on to be much yeah. more than that in when you were well, fifteen years old I or mean it it was something I think it's really valuable to to um to learn a skill at at an age where you're you know you, where you're like between 10 and 15 or something like that like you absorb so much and you have the time that you don't have to worry about your fucking bills and all this other shit like you can actually just focus on something purely so i'll be coming home from school and just uh you know just hunched over turntables working the entire time um and went from that to deciding i wanted to basically a track was a was a huge inspiration for me because he'd he won the, the world championships at a very young age um and i think i'd seen the video of that and he's he's a couple of years older than me and i was like right that's that's what i want to do you know that's and from there went went on to to competing in in a bunch of the the sort of battle DJ circuit. And you did you used to run the Scottish hip hop forum or something <laughs> like that? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> okay. Allegedly. Um I think it's here interesting to touch on that because you know for hip hop fans in the room, that era that you're talking about of turntablism is often associated with like digging records, getting an MPC, yeah. make yeah. a beat. Yeah. yeah. And your best Which I think it's still relevant but yeah, you know, of course. But I think it's interesting. It's more common, you know, now for people to use a computer to make music in, in, course, in any way. Course, course. But at that time, you know, sort of making the kind of music that you were interested in with like Fruity Loops was a bit, people were a bit snobby about that, weren't they? I mean, the, the, I think there's that, that sort of stigma against Fruity Loops still exists. You know what I mean? Like if, but... I've always said, you know, if you were to look at the, the actual, you know, just as a as a as an example, the the top ten Billboard songs, I guarantee that probably eight of them were made on Fruity Loops, you know what I mean? but people will still not acknowledge it as as professional piece of software. But, you know, it does everything that I need it to do. So. Let's talk about the genesis, the the foundation of of ending up making music on Fruity Loops. Am I right in thinking that it started on a PlayStation? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I started on a PlayStation, which is a, I guess, a 
way quite a few people started because you know f- but for me anyway it was before the era where we had a, a you know we even had a computer in the house and I guess this was kind of late still, but it was just maybe like 98, 99 or something. And it was like, well, I don't have any other means of making music than here's this PlayStation, here's this game. I may as well like throw myself into that, learn how to. And what can you explain it? What was it like sequencing on a PlayStation for people that haven't seen it? Um, it's the the actual, I mean, it's, I guess they call it a game, but it was... It, what I've heard is that it's very similar to how a lot of the old drum and bass stuff was made as far as um, working on the, the early Atari computers and that, that sort of thing. Um, so I think it's it, it was actually a similar process to that, but I had no idea of that at the time. I was just sort of like, you know, just learning the process of how to use that particular piece of software. Yeah. So were you sort of being influenced by computer games at the same time then? As, uh, yeah, sonically yeah, yeah, speaking, yeah, yeah. I mean, like yeah, in yeah. terms of sound. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Full on Metal Gear, you know. <laughs> what was the first piece of music you made? What was the first tune you made? Oh, God. Um, the first piece of music I made, I think, was like... Uh, it must have been a piece in, in school to for like a you know some sort of like college submission thing something like that some drum and bass bullshit (laughs) but no that was that was a that must have been that must have been when i was about i guess like 14 15 something like have you got an, any music to hand on the laptop that would be the sort of thing <laughs> that you might have been listening to at 14? Yeah. Like, yeah, what yeah, were you yeah. into me, at let school? Me switch, let me switch to yeah. Mini Jack. There. So, I mean, this is, this is the type of stuff that was really uh, inspiring to me at the time. Um... Let me see. And you're too young to go to a club at this point. Yeah, right? well, I hadn't, I hadn't never been to a club at that point, but you know, this was uh, oh, this was the kind of music that I was listening to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to bring it back to Glasgow at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that stuff was huge in Glasgow, you know, and. Um, I, we we actually make a point of of uh, doing little one off events with the like playing this type of stuff every so often um, because you know again there's there's a stigma against it but if you if you play that in a club in Glasgow people will <laughs> people will go insane for that yeah. you know and for for people that aren't familiar with Glasgow obviously we've got pretty much every country yeah, yeah, represented yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, you know, Glasgow really is one of the clubbing capitals of the UK. You know, people talk about London and Manchester and Glasgow is definitely in the same sentence, but it really is unique. There's nowhere else like Glasgow in terms of the intensity of the city and how that sort of is reflected in the unique energy in clubs. Can you sort of talk to us about what that feeling is? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's maybe because of the size of the city and because of its because it's a post-industrial place where you know traditionally there's over the last couple of decades been a lot of unemployment and a lot of you know a lot of hardship for people and the size of the city means that you know when when there's a, a, a an event on that a lot of people come together to you know to like just unite and have a have a good party you know and i think that's one of the main things and also, I always say, like, part of uh, part of the because it has traditionally has such bad weather that it, that can cause people to actually make happy music. <laughs> um, talk to me about some Glasgow legends, people that you looked up to, DJs or producers or 
you know, musical people that led the way? Um, I mean, as far as who I looked up to at, uh, at that point, um, I uh, I really looked up to two guys called um, the Freak Maneuvers, who were like a turntablist crew, and you know they were the main sort of like hip hop scratch DJs in Glasgow, and they put me on you know student radio for the first time in in my life when i was like you know whatever early early teens um and th- them and i guess the the, the optimal guys there's a inc- well, there was an incredible club night in glasgow called optimal um where the, the it really just opened my mind to so much new music because it was primarily a techno night but with a real sort of like punk ethos but also they'd be playing soundtracks at the start of the night while people were coming into the club they're playing soundtrack records they're also playing like you know 50s seven inches stuff like that and you know it was just like how are how are they getting away with this in a club environment and people are still like and that that was such an inspiration to me to see that like happening i I was working at the club at the time I was just working behind the bar at the club and to to see that sort of happening in front of me people like losing their mind to some like you know literally some 1940s song or some shit like that. It was just like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, it's crazy. But that was a huge inspiration to me as well. So tell us about the club that you ended up doing because there was a very important place where you met some important people, right? Yeah, I mean, we started uh, we started a night at a little, a little venue called Stereo and... It was, you know, it was it was really just a bar. It wasn't a it wasn't a club by any means. Um, and uh, where's Callum now? <laughs> Callum Callum started Callum started his, his his rival night in a in another venue called uh, called, Ad, <laughs> called Adlib, and uh, and um, you know after uh, after a certain amount of time, um, I guess our the night that myself and and uh, my friend Dominic were running was primarily hip hop focused and the, the night Calm was running with Jack Master and the, the numbers crew was I guess a bit more electronic focused and at some point they we sort of just rather than being rivals we we sort of you know joined forces and were like nah we should we should really like own this, you know. There's no point as two little small nights be, like being rivals, and fucking, you know, it's a small enough city to yeah. not need that. You know? And actually, this record that you have queued up here is the first joint release that we actually did. Tell you what I did last night. I came home say So anyway, yeah. So that was that was the sort of. Um, that was the kind of combination of our idea of of wanting to combine this elements of real commercial r and b and hip hop with a little bit more left field electronic production and um none of it was cleared officially <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> sh- <laughs> yeah. shut up <laughs> um but uh, th- it it um you know it was it was a a hit kind of after party and club record in the city at the time, and it also exposed me to a lot of new listeners as well, which um you know did a lot for me at the time. Was it sort of a good practice, almost like a replacement for the ability to work with US artists or even a singer Absolutely, or rapper yeah. or whatever? Yeah, well, I mean... Was at, that clear that that was part yeah, of your dreams? Or yeah, thing? I mean, at that point, uh, at that point, my, f- m- you know, my focus was 
like I I desperately want to be working with you know mainstream US art or well, not even technically US but like you know mainstream R&B and hip hop acts but I'm like a kid in my mum's house in Glasgow in this city that's raining all the time in the middle of nowhere like how would that ever how would that ever happen you know so it was like right well I'll get a bunch of get a bunch of acapellas off of Soul Seek <laughs> <laughs> Callum was talking about Soul Seek earlier. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone talking about Soul Seek. It's really good how like um these things can, you know, set the exact time period. Like this period that we're talking about right now is in the height of the MySpace era. I remember discovering exactly, you exactly, on MySpace. That's exactly, how I first yeah. found you. Yeah. And um I hope Soul you, Seek I hope and you top it me. Yeah, of course, standard. Um <laughs> but um the Freemo tune. Yeah. That's yeah, sort yeah, of like yeah. from that era, right? Should we play yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Um yeah. I mean, have you got I, it? I don't know if I don't know if I even still have it on here. But, yeah. but tell us about Hudson's heaters. What was that? Well, so I, uh, I think it was like over 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 Christmas one year. I <laughs> over over Christmas one year, I was like, right, I'm just gonna make a bunch of a bunch of beats and ended up making like i don't know 11 beats in three days or something like that and then was like right well i don't really want to put them out because i don't think they're good enough um i'm just going to put them out for free on you know put a download link up and just fucking see what happens and um uh, they ended up that that kind of took off as well and um, a bunch of those tracks from that have subsequently been released on various compilations and, and, and uh, other records as well. Mm. So we're talking like 2007 or something like this? Uh, that, that was 2006, I think it was. Yeah. Okay. The, I mean, the other, the other thing to... The, the other thing about this uh, collection of sort of instrumentals that were included on that uh, on on the heaters tape was that you know I was kind of sending them to MCs and stuff like that and for the most part the reaction was like there's nothing I can do with this this is like this is too too much of a mess for me to like put a verse over or anything like that so I was like right fuck it I'll just just put them out as instrumentals <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is interesting to talk about that because I do remember at the time a lot of your music was super left, like kind of mad syncopated and, you know, well, it, was it was very it was seen as that, time, But yeah. I think that it was seen as that, but now you know that's fucking chart music, Normal. you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it's interesting just as sort of an overall question for you to say, I dreamt of working with these people. It was 2006. I'm living at my mum's in the middle of nowhere in your perception in Glasgow. Um, so sort of working with Kanye West m starting to make the tune that we heard at the beginning of the lecture in 2012. Six years is kind of not a long time to make that dream a reality. If you could sort of pick one thing on that journey as in in terms of like what a really crucial step of you moving towards realizing that dream, what would you what would you choose? Um, I mean, there's 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 a number of things, but I think one would be, you know, uh, I was I was mainly pursuing just a a solo DJ career at that point, and I remember arriving at a festival in in like Hungary or somewhere like that, and receiving it like a one line email that just said, "Can you come to?" LA night in like two days time or something like that you know and uh that that was like right uh okay um I guess I guess I can <laughs> come that way but uh, you know it's it was a very surreal experience in terms of right I'm here doing like a you know relatively okay festival but it, you know it's me just performing on my own and it, you know to suddenly get an email from like uh uh an address which is like at com, 
is like, oh, okay, right, this is actually, <laughs> this is actually happening now. So bringing it back to um to oops and the and the kind of like vibration that that had for you, um, it's important to talk a bit more about the sort of um the numbers, the lucky me, wire yeah, block, yeah, and that era yeah. because you know your crews have gone on to influence a whole next generation now and had a massive effect on dance music and hip hop and you yeah. know like I mean do you want to talk a bit further about all the people involved in that? Yeah, I mean it's something that I you know i it's i'm my own worst enemy with it because i i acknowledge that what we built out of that scene in glasgow has influenced popular music in general but i i would never go out and be like yeah i invented that yeah. i did that i fucking you know so um you know i i, I acknowledge that it's it's uh, been an influence mm. on a lot of mainstream pop music now, but um, I would never uh, claim to have I think you just any did. sort of ownership <laughs> over it. But it's 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 it's, it's how music works, and you hear something you like, you, mm. you you run with it. You know, I mean, like the stuff that I was making was uh, I was just in my head, I was just ripping off people whose music that I really liked. Have yeah. you got any of it? The stuff that um, you really liked? Yeah, I mean... Big influence stuff. Yeah. You should play some of that. And I've also heard you talking in the past about IDM and R&B or something. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And trying to combine those two things yeah. at the time for you. Yeah. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. So some something like this was like a huge, huge influence for me. So to to me that to me at the time of making that that's just 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 a straight up hip hop beat. But the way it seemed to be perceived was that this is some like weird electronic left kind of you know. I was using like IDM type shit. Where I was no, you said that. I didn't say. <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't even know me what IDM was, means. What does well, IDM mean? Well, it, it was an an old term for for intelligent dance music. You not, know, what I'm I mean? not in it like, exactly. Um, but it was perceived as some sort of left field electronic mm -hmm. kind of thing, which. I wasn't really expecting because it, uh, to me again to me it was just like it's just me making hip hop beats but um so that opened me up to a new audience as well can you tell me what lucky me is lucky me is uh well it's kind of changing by the year but um it was the name of the first club night that we started running in 2002 i think and it grew from a small club night to a, a record label to a fashion brand to, um, you know, uh, was a filmmaking arm of it, a photography arm, just a group of a group of uh, or a group of creatives, basically all all um, collaborating. And how did you first meet Dominic Flanagan? Fucking hell! I think, it <laughs> God, um, I get. I think I remember. I think I actually remember one of the DJ battles, like one of the very, very first DJ battles I ever did. But we've, you know, we've been sort of creative partners along with another another guy called Martin Flynn. Um, we've been creative partners now for for. Fifteen years or something like that. You know. He, I think it's definitely important for us to talk about Dom because he has such an influence on the creative, on the visual, Absolutely, on the videos, yeah. on the Absolutely, design, yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a little known fact that he used to MC as well. <laughs> but, we'll, we'll, but we'll keep it moving. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just joking, Dom. But um, I want to talk to you about this record, Heralds of Change, yes. um, which I think might have been the first bit of vinyl that I got from you. Actually, it's you alongside uh, Mike Slot. This is from yes. 2007. Yeah. On an Irish label called um, All City. Yeah. 
Um, tell us about this project. Uh, this was a a, a a joint production project with um, a good friend of mine who, um, you know, it's an, another another situation of we were we were both making music in Glasgow and we're like, right, why not just try out some shit together, basically, and um, put out this record, which is just like a really just like a load of instrumentals but it kind of took off on its own little journey of its own also um let's see i can't even remember what's on it yeah please spot it So 2007, right? Which was also the year that you were a participant in the Academy. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's good to have you on the couch in <laughs> 2015. How was your Academy experience in 2007? It was um, extremely nerve-wracking for me because it was like, it was the first time I'd been... It was the first time I think I'd been on a, on a long-haul flight, I think, actually, because I was in Toronto... Um, and you know, it, I was never, never the most like, you know, but never, never the kind of guy to just like jump into a room and be like, yo, let's make loads of music, you know, like it's, I was always kind of like made music alone. So to be thrust into that environment with a load of people that you don't know, I suppose, like, actually really refreshing and I still keep in touch with quite a few of the people uh, who I was in, in the academy with at that point. Yeah. I mean, I guess everyone here on day one had to come up and do the thing on the couch where you introduce yourself and no one likes it and it's always awkward yeah. and everyone hates it and some people are more natural at it than others but fundamentally we all have the same fear. Um, does it get any easier? You know, having been in that position as someone who you just said yourself didn't naturally come out of his shell. Does it get easier over the years? Um, I think you just, yeah, from experience, you just learn how to to handle yourself in particular situations. But um, that was certainly like a steep learning curve, you know, yeah. to be thrown in at the deep end like that. But I'm I'm really thankful that you know when I actually got the the uh, the email that that I gotten into the academy and I was like what like I was blown away by that because mm. I'd seen you know there was a couple of TV programs and stuff about it I think around that point and I was like wow if I could get into this this would be like this would blow my mind and um, you know filled out the ridiculous application <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had no no uh, no hopes of, of getting in really but but I'm super, super thankful that uh, mm. I, I had that opportunity. Yeah. And um, something pretty special happened on on that academy, I remember, because there was a lecture with Steve Beckett yes. from Warp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that was around the time when he decided to sign you to Warp Recording. Yeah. Um, that was the first time that I'd met Steve, and we'd, we'd been briefly in touch before that. But Steve Beckett is the, the, the person who founded Warp Records, which is the label that I, I release uh, on. But I had never met him before, and he came and gave a lecture, and he, that was just really inspiring in itself because to see someone who's like, you know, he's, I guess, you know, Steve's probably... A, he's probably, you know, almost 60 now or something like that. And to see him still have his ears, like, so much to the ground for, for someone like me who was just, like, you know, putting out records which we were pressing, like, 300 copies or something like that, for him to be aware of something like that was, like, mind-blowing for me. 
And wasn't Rusty was being signed around the same time as well? Was that right? Rusty got signed? I think about a year or two later. But we were we were um, we were pretty much doing stuff at the at the same time, yeah, yeah. and flying Lotus as well. Yeah, and it seemed like you and Rusty had a bit of a symbiotic relationship in terms of influence as well. And yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I mean, like. I'm the, I'm the biggest Rusty fan <laughs> um, I guess like I don't know, he's he's uh, he's informed my sound and I've I've informed his sound and yeah. it's like you know I think it was for for a period it was like and it still is to some extent but like I think it's quite good to have a kind of a, a sparring partner sure. when you're making music as well because you're like ah, I can I'm gonna one up you on that, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of fun to like have that though. Do you uh, feel that healthy competition thing, or do you not? Do you not bite? I mean, I st- I think it's healthy in terms of keeping you motivated and stuff like yeah. that. I yeah. do think it's healthy. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about the effect that um you know signing to Warp Records had for you personally, and in terms of perception in the wider world, but also what it's been like working with them since then. Um. It's you know it's it's been amazing because there there's not that many labels that I'm aware of that are the 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 size of Warp in terms of their their distribution and their their outreach, b- but they'll still give you complete creative freedom, which is uh, it's not something that's. I'm not going to name any other labels, but it's not something that you're going to get from too many labels that are that are on on their kind of level. So I'm I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to 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 release with them. And I'm f- I'm still super grateful to have that that level of creative freedom to be like, right, well I've made this record that sounds like this, but the next record I'm going to do is going to be entirely different and. You're not going to tell me that I can't do that because I'm just going to fucking do it. You know what I mean? And they're like, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah. And this is the first one you did on Warp, right? Yeah, Polyfolk Dance, which yeah, is yeah. actually just six amazing tunes. Um, Polka Dot Blues is classic. Velvet Peel Speed Stick, I think, is the real overlooked Hudson Mohawk joint. Uh, by the way, this, cause I think you're the only person who gets the drum pattern of it. Everyone else. Is like, what the f- was always my favorite. I don't know why everyone's so late on that tune. Speed stick, mark my words, will become a Hudson My Hot classic. But we're going to play overnight, is that all right? Because that's the big one. I mean, this is the, that's something else which at the time was given to like a bunch of MCs and everyone was like... Don't know what to do with this. Like it's, I can't, I can't make a song with this. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely true that there's a thread in your music that always seems to be ahead of its time. And I know that sounds a bit corny, but it's it's so true, man. Because at, I used to play this all the time in clubs. What is this? Two thousand nine, and people would, you know, half the room was definitely not ready for it. But it's you play it now, and people think it's the the sound of the club, you know. So. Um, has that been frustrating for you or is that something that excites you when people don't get you <laughs> straight away? Um, I mean, obviously there's an element of frustration in it, obviously, yeah. but, um, you know, especially when there's like a whole crop of people coming off the back of that, that, sure, <laughs> that, sure. are, that are because people are now ready for the sound. It's like, you know, they get a lot of shine from that but I mean I can't help making the music that I want to make at a particular time and that's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like dumb it down for for a particular era or a particular crowd or whatever you know so around this time I suppose the demand for you to play live and to DJ and all of that kind of stuff started to pick up right as soon as you started releasing on Warp and now, obviously, as most people know that make music in the room, you know, uh, releasing records, sadly, is is often a business card for getting DJ bookings, right? In terms of actually paying the bills, as you were saying before, it's not selling the records that often pays, it's the DJ gigs that come around them. 
Um, how did you deal with that pressure? Because you strike me as someone that's whose comfort zone is very much the studio. Like you're you're happiest in the studio. You seem, you know, at peace yeah. in the studio. And then suddenly everyone's expecting you to go and perform. How do you deal with that newfound sort of pressure of having to wheel wheel out the decks on stage and do it live? I mean, I certainly have had my share of of uh, you know shows like you're saying where you playing stuff like that and most of the room is just like you know um but i think it's just uh, uh again it's just you know spending time doing it and and and, and building on it and it's something that you can i guess you can get more more sort of like ballsy with it as you as you you know as you kind of become more comfortable in front of crowds you can be like right well fuck you i'm just going to play this <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and uh you know sooner or later people will come around to it one question i have to ask you listening to tunes like rising five and you know some of the drum programming just makes me wonder were you actually a drummer before you were a drum programmer because it's like yeah, you do things yeah, that only yeah, a drummer yeah. would actually do in yeah, terms of rolls yeah. and hi hi hats and stuff like I that. I was a I was a drummer, but only only in school. I never pursued it further than that. Um, I kind of wish that I had, but it's. I, I guess it's just you know now it's I really just do it with programming, but um, I guess once you once you've been drumming for a certain amount of years, you have that mindset of where where a particular role belongs or where a particular yeah, yeah, yeah. little flam belongs or whatever yeah should we play a bit of rising five as well yeah go for this tell us about this album yeah so this was the, this is the first um let me get the, 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 the sleeve there this is a record that's called butter which was the first full-length record that i released I was particularly proud of the the uh, hippopotamus in the, in the gatefold. <laughs> 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 um, the same guy, the same guy who did uh, who did the the polyfolk sleeve. Um, but yeah, this was the this was the first full length that I released, and um, I also confused a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I just want to play this one for the the Hudmo drums. Also, um, Chris Brown ripped that and really? and made a song out of it, and now owes me a bunch of money. So, Chris <laughs> Brown, if you're watching this, <laughs> you can fucking. <laughs> what tune is it? What's his tune called? I, I want to look it up. I can't even remember. Come what on, it's don't like so some mix tape tune. I don't know. Okay, well, that is an amazing example of you know the drums that you do that I love. But there's another really important side to your composition. Um, loads of people that have computers and drum machines and NPCs can make great beats, but it's a harder thing to have a real grasp of writing a hook or writing a melody or writing a song. And I think that that is one of the things, one of the many things that really sets you apart. And um, I just wanted you to talk to, to us a little bit about the importance of that because everyone says, oh yeah, Hudmo Beatmaker, yeah, obviously one of the greatest beat makers in the world at the moment. But people often overlook your ability with music and um, composition and hooks and musicianship. I think it's just, you know, I, I, I don't sing, but I can hear a, a hook over, over a set of chords or something like that. So like, it's kind of like, it's not, I'm not writing it on a, keyboard or anything i'm just sort of like right i know that i can hear this particular melody playing over the top of this and you know just kind of there's no real explanation <laughs> behind this and it's you play it yourself um yeah i i i program it in myself i mean i can't i i can almost play keys but i mean as far as as far as key playing i mean Wherever Oliver is, Oliver has been a huge inspiration to me as well as, as far as like trying to learn <laughs> to, to play keys properly. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
and musically, where do you think, you know, obviously we can hear you've played hip hop, we played Just Blaze, you know, it's clear from the drums where a lot of your feeling and influence comes from and also the, the pitched up happy hardcore stuff. But musically, there's a big soul thing going on in there as well. Where's that coming from? Um, that's, I mean, I guess it's coming from from my dad's records, which is like a super cliche answer that everybody says. No, no, like, that's where I was going with know. it, yeah. But um, yeah, it it's uh, came from from being raised off, and not even anything pr- that's particularly, you know, underground or anything like that. Just like you know, with the Vandross records and stuff mm. like that. But the or you know, Anita Baker records or this type of thing. But stuff that. I was listening to, or I was being played at a f- very young age that sort of resonated with me, maybe like subconsciously. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. And there's there's something else as well which is unique to you, which is almost um, I don't know what the word is. It's like folk or something in there. That's do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I mean, I think that's also from. Um, I guess that's that's also. Like, probably comes from from Glasgow as well because yeah. there's a there's a big sort of art school kind of rock slash you know I hesitate to use the word folk but like you know yeah. electronic left field kind of uh, scene uh, surrounding the the art school in Glasgow. Um, which is also where we were doing a lot of our events. So we were getting support gigs for, even though we were doing stuff like this, myself and, and uh, like, the people, myself and, like, Rusty and whoever, were getting support gigs for, like, Caribou or, you know, uh, like, Sage Francis or some, like, stuff that had, you know, came from not necessarily the same world at all. But yeah. we were being exposed to it, so we yeah. it kind of took a, a an influence on our on our own productions. Well, I think one of the best examples of all of the things we've just been talking about the melody, the songwriting, all of those bits is um, it's, it's got to be Fuse. <laughs> so, talk to me about um, some of the crews that you've linked up with, notably. Jack and the Canadian c- connection, and in particular yeah. Lunas. Yeah, so I guess like around the time when we were, uh, when we were developing our, our little scene in Glasgow, there was a, a similar thing developing in Montreal, and also a similar thing developing in LA, with a, you know, the particular sound coming out of these like really small like grungy club nights um and so i think maybe i guess it was like the year the year after i was in the academy we decided that we would do like a sort of gig swap where a bunch of us from scotland would go out to montreal and LA do some shows there and we would in turn have them back to play in Scotland and um, you know pretty much everyone out of that crew of people has gone on to to be fairly successful in their own right um, but um, in particular Lun- Lunas uh, I connected with him and we spoken for years about doing a record together you know we spoke for four or five years about oh we need to get in the studio we have to get in the studio and we eventually you know we eventually spent like two or three days in the studio made this record with uh, no no sort of uh, idea of it being anything no I no intention of releasing it no like project name for it or anything like that um just like here's some stuff that we probably wouldn't make 
on our own. So let's just like throw some ideas together and just see where it goes. And it ended up being the becoming this project called Tonight, um, which uh, we then decided we well, maybe maybe we should release these, <laughs> and uh, you know pressed up the records, and then that sort of took off as its own kind of little scene in itself as well. There was a tune, wasn't there, that you'd done that was that never that sort of higher ground replaced. Do you want to tell us the story of that? <laughs> No. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, maybe we should just play something from tonight's uh, EP then. Yeah. Uh, it's I possible it's you may have heard one of these before if you've been anywhere near any sort of festival slash club slash house party slash iTunes well, I mean, the in the thing, last five years. The other thing I was going to say before I play this is that um, nowadays I feel like this is you know this this sound is kind of it's a little bit done for me but it is the sound of like fucking budweiser advert or such and such advert or you know every brand is having remakes done of the but what was really exciting about the stuff at the time when we actually made it and about the time when, when we released it was the fact that because there was no such thing as quote unquote like EDM trap or whatever you want to call it, because that didn't really exist, um, you we were getting all, all sorts of you know a, across the board DJs playing the songs from yourself to fucking Richie Houghton to Calvin Harris to you know because no one knew where to file it because the, the that sort of sound didn't have a it hadn't been kind of pigeonholed yet so it was really exciting for us at the time because the, the record even ended up on on billboard chart somewhere it was like number 150 or something but even that was just like mind-blowing for us um but let me let me find something here Um, are you sick of hearing that one yet? <laughs> <laughs> I've been sick of hearing that one. I've been sick. <laughs> um, I have to say that, though, watching sort of 10,000 people going nuts to that tune at Coachella right at the height of that summer that it was really popping off was, you know, exciting enough for me being right in the middle of the crowd. So I can only imagine what it was like to be able to do that. Two producers on stage. You know, it wasn't really a tried and tested format. You know, we no, know the that's, DJ that's producer format. But yeah. it was like that you yeah. you kind of took it somewhere different in terms of what's possible for the producer slash DJ instead of DJ slash producer. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a, uh, an experiment, really, you know, and it, a lot of it was just, you know, fucking around and seeing, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and... Um, you know, it really, it really worked for a long time until the point where I was like, I'm fucking bored of doing this. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I wanted I, to, I want to, I want to, I want to do something a little bit more varied. And like every interview I do now, it's like, oh, when is the next Tonight record coming? When is the next fucking? And I'm like, well, it'll be there when it, it'll be there when it's there, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a really good subject to talk about, actually, the power of no and the power of saying no and knowing when to say no and knowing about the art of ending things, you know, because um, it would have been very easy for you to rinse that one to high heaven, you know, and yet you decided to not do that and go off and make a, your solo albums, respectively. Um, yeah. I mean, th that, that EP ended up with, you know, the, the whole shit of like um, you know US US majors being like right we need 10 beats that sound exactly like this let's put 10 different rappers on them we can get anyone you want we'll make an album we'll fucking and like that would be great for like a year or two years and then I'll be fucking gone and, you know like, where's where's your where's your career then you know 
So was that sort of the moment that you learned about how to negotiate saying no to things that you'd otherwise love to do? Is that sort of mad period? Have you got any advice to impart about the importance of maintaining a balance in your creative endeavours? I mean, yeah, I just, I think it's just important. To, I mean, this is just for me personally, but it's just important to keep things varied and keep yourself interested creatively rather than settling into just, oh, this is what people want to hear, so I better just keep making this over and over and, and yeah. you know. Um, because that's a very easy, uh, you know, it's a very easy thing to fall into. Um, but it's it's not for me anyway. It's not particularly uh, exciting, or you know, it, do it doesn't it doesn't give me the chills that that I got when we made those songs in the first place, or when they when they were like at the height of their popularity, you know. And so, of course, tonight, y yourself and Lunis ended up being the main production credit on Blood on the Leaves, which is the song we heard at the front, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the lecture. Um, talk to me about the process of working on Jesus, how that came and, and when, what what it was like ending up working with Rick Rubin at Shangri-La. Um, I mean, I'm always, I'm always very cagey about I mean, you were there yourself, you know, but um, you know what it's like as far as uh, it's what, what you're allowed to say. Yeah, no, it's, it's say. definitely <laughs> always essential to observe the studio code. And so vagueness will be accepted. But I'm I'm just saying like um, yeah. on a personal well, I mean, front to have done it. Again, to, uh, to sit in a room that's probably you know no bigger than this little area here with Rick Rubin and Kanye just and just like be like right now I feel like this should go see here this should sit here this sounds good here it's just like going from I mean, to go back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of like being in my mum's house in Glasgow it's like Right, how am I on a, a ranch in Malibu? Like, <laughs> in a fucking little room with Rick Rubin, you know? Um, so, again, like, mind-blowing experience. But it's, you know, like we're saying, as far as, like, the, the, the details of it, it's like, you have to be kind of, like... You know, you can't say too much. No, for sure. Um, talking of details, you are definitely a details person when it comes to, you know, your craft of making tunes and beats. I mean, I can't say what it is that makes you stand out against the next beat maker, but it's definitely got to be something to do with the level of detail and precision that you put into making things. I mean, is there a bit of advice that you could give any producer or, or studio head, no matter what genre they make, yeah, I would say um, again, just personally, a lot of the stuff I make, I don't release, and I end up wishing that I had released. So, release music, because <laughs> yeah. like probably about seventy five percent of the stuff I make never gets, never sees the light of day, mm. and then I listen to it again a year later. I'm like, why the fuck did I not put that out? You know. But um got any dub plates to play? <laughs> uh, but no, I think it's just important, especially now in this in this um, SoundCloud age. You know, mm. it's it's important to have that that presence. You know, what right? I mean? Okay, that's why you know, like if if I would do anything differently, it would be like release more music mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. and so i mean since well in the more recent time you've worked with drake with pusher with lil wayne do you want to pick any of those songs to play for us and talk about the experience uh, of working in that environment those worlds let me see i mean this was this was a song i did with with uh pusher and 
Red Cross. So one question I wanted to ask you on a purely practical one is like when all this stuff starts to happen and things pop off and suddenly, you know, you're getting calls from Drake or Frank Ocean or whoever it might be or their representatives saying we want to work with you. Mm -hmm. How does the structure around you actually have to change to cope with that? How does your team have to change? How does how do you deal with getting the right manager or the right person to negotiate this world yeah, of selling beats I and mean, stuff? It does, it's 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 difficult if you come from a a purely or a, a more electronic background you don't have that you don't have you have to learn this whole new world of you know this is how it works in terms of selling beats and and uh, you know working with mainstream artists and this type of thing so it's a, it's it's a learning process and you need to you need to really make sure that you have a tight team um because otherwise you're going to be waiting on a lawyer for like you know three months to send back a contract or some shit like that or you know you need to make sure that you you stay on your your people and you you like you, you know you delegate stuff but try and project manage it as much as you can personally try and oversee as much of it as you can to make sure it's exactly how you want it to be, basically. Mm. So business-wise, it can be frustrating, but creatively, is it one of the most fulfilling things you've done working with those artists in that yeah, environment? Yeah, I mean... How but, was the first but, time? But, I mean, I've always said that as much as I, I love working with these artists, it's the same buzz that I got from finding out that I was going to be able to work with Warp or something yeah. like that, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's it's a new, it's a next step, it's like a new endeavour, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with like the fame of such and such a person or, you know, it's more just like, this is a whole new, like, you know, a whole new world for me to learn about and explore. And yeah. Like, keep things creatively interesting for myself like I was saying and talking of which if we bring it right up to date with your with your current album you know we're talking about all this stuff and you've got all this pressure and people wanting to work with you and everything and you went off and made a piece of orchestral music and a song with Anthony from <laughs> Anthony and the Johnsons which is you know definitely not the turn that most people that are sitting in A&R offices wanting 10 no. new tonight beats would have expected you to do or wanted me to do. <laughs> or wanted you to do, exactly, <laughs> which is ma what makes it even yeah. more awesome. But, I mean, um, how did the relationship with Anthony come about? Um, Anthony is someone who I've admired for years and years since since I heard that, that first record, you know. Someone played me that, the, you know, his first record at, at uh, an after party at like eight in the morning or something. And... I was like, what the fuck is this? This is just like, is this, what kind of voice is this? This is just insane. Like, I don't understand what kind of music this is, where this is like, um, and that was like, he became someone who I, I put on my bucket list of people that I really wanted to work with. And I, I pursued that for years and years and it never fucking worked. And, uh, Eventually, he approached me, luckily. Wow. But um, it it actually worked out really well, and we we're, we're now gonna be um, releasing a collaborative full length record um, in the near near future as well. But again, it's definitely not the sort of thing that um, you know hip hop A and R wanted would have wanted me to do. <laughs> Do you want to play yeah. a bit of that? Yeah, let me play that just now. So this is taken from the current album, which came out this summer, right? Yes. Uh. You wanted me. <sighs> How much 
how many of the tunes that you do as collaborative pieces with well-known vocalists or rappers are actually you know in the studio collaborating and how many of how many of them is just like deliver the beat and see what comes back and which um, do you enjoy more uh, nowadays almost all of them are face to face um but certainly for for like quite a long time there was like here's a beat just see what see what happens you know um and i think that's still the case for even for a lot of major stuff that's still that's still the case um i have grown to prefer working face to face with people just to have more of a a creative flow rather than just like here's one bit here's the other bit shove them together and you know and it's better to work work it up as a song together and that's something that actually I probably, probably like one of the first times I had done that properly was at the academy actually, <laughs> but um, you know, it's still something that I'm not, I'm not incredible at. I'm still working on that craft because that's a craft in itself. You know, working along someone who might have completely different, a complete different creative vision for a, for a song or something like that, but um learning that craft is, is is really important i think 100 yeah. percent. is there something you want to play before we we have to wrap it up um i mean i'll probably play this uh i'll probably play this kettle song mm. so this is another song from the the current album but this is a, a an orchestral piece um but I'll just play it. Now for all the tech heads in here, I've got to ask what how how was that made? Is that how much of that is samples, how much of that is an orchestra? Um, how much of it's played? It's all programmed. Amazing. Um, but it's uh yeah, fruit loops, <laughs> fruit loops again, <laughs> all programmed. Um, as so I, anyone as that I was saying, like I can't, I can't, I can't play for shit. So like you know, it's it's uh, it's programmed in, but um, just with a with a orchestral sample library. You know, um, so you took me a long time, basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but. Uh, it's again it's one of these things where like once you get in the zone with something that just sort of like flows you you're not really thinking about what's what's going where you're just it's just sort of flowing out of you basically amazing well this seems like a pretty good idea pretty good moment rather to um see if there are any more technical questions or any other sort of questions for that matter oh look well it's quite a few hands already um <laughs> So it's questions from the floor. Questions are Tradition is that there is someone with a English, microphone. Please? So when we have the microphone, we'll be. A Thank you very much. Who's first? Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you for your lecture. Um, you talked about like having different uh, creative visions about songs when you make, you know, songs with the other people, and definitely you like had this. I don't know if it's a frustration, but something that, you know, p uh, rappers can't uh, rap on your old stuff. And my question is, like, as a producer, do you sometimes, like, you know, maintain your creativity to, like, okay, uh, this rapper, uh, uh, he, he should rap on this, so I, you know, like, uh, mute some stuff and, you know, just do uh, something, like, Basic uh, rough stuff. I, I ha if I understand what you're saying, I have done little things like that in the past where I've like made, m like created a little bit of space in the track to allow for a vocalist or something like that. But for the most part, I uh, nowadays I'm I sort I'm sort of like no, you you're gonna rap on this. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Because sometimes I'm like, okay, 
this is too hard to wrap it on is, this. It is frustrating, though. It yeah. is very frustrating. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Next one behind you, I think. Just there. Oh, sorry. Excuse sorry. me. Hello. I was first. Oh, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, I happen to notice that you have a lot of like complex arrangements. I I don't know, like how to explain it, but I wonder how are what are your references to do that because what you show up that you grow up listening to it. It's like really raw stuff and. This last song you just show it. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't knew before this, mm -hmm. and I'm really surprised about how you managed to do counterpoints and all the timbers and what you listen like from yeah. the 18th century kind of <laughs> <laughs> Mahler, you know Gustav Mahler. I, I don't uh -huh. know if you have this kind of reference. <laughs> a lot of like a great deal about classical music at all so it's in terms of the the actual you know the the terminology of it and um, the the arrangement etc like I, i'm not familiar with what the, the the sort of done thing is so it's mainly just experimenting again um Like I'm not classically trained at all, so it's just it's just experimenting basically. <laughs> so that's the only answer I can hmm. give. Really. Well done. Hey, how's it going? Hi. Right. So I have a question about like mental health and um, the whole like touring thing, because yeah. I mean, like you seem like a pretty like to yourself reclusive person, yeah. and I can empathize with that and. Playing shows is quite the opposite environment, yeah, yeah. and shit can get pretty crazy, especially yeah. like like with all the partying and like the amount of yeah, yeah. dates you have to do. So like, how do you how do you find a balance? What's your experience, Ben? Um, I mean, it's something we vaguely touched on earlier, but it's it's um, learning to say no to certain things. You know what I mean? And you know, saying I can't do this tour. Or you know, I, I can't, I can't be in the studio on this date because I'm going to fucking kill myself <laughs> if I have to do this shit. You know, what I mean? if I have to spend another day doing this fucking. Um, no, uh, I think it's you know I did I did have an an experience where um, I just really burnt myself out, and from that point I sort of was like you know you, you have to you can't do everything you have to you have to focus in on one particular thing do that for the for a period of time do this for a period of time allow yourself time to like have some space in your head you know which i'm still not very good at but I'm, again i'm learning but that's that's the only advice I can give on that is just to try and try and leave some some space for your own <laughs> right, thank you hey how you doing I will get over to you next I know you're hidden in the corner uh, just rather than going over there and back again and um, just I loved your orchestral stuff I think it's incredible and, and I really really like when electronic musicians or people who aren't from the orchestral world or academically trained use the palette and color of an orchestra to work with um, And I just wondered, I think it was, what was this Tyone Di Braxton's album, the first one, I think is yeah, a great yeah, example yeah. of that. It was really refreshing. So another, like, album that really confused people as well. Yeah, <laughs> I think it still does, to be honest. Um, but I was just wondering if you've been approached to do any film work at all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a few things at the moment, but again, it's the same the same NDA stuff where it's like you can't yeah, you can't see. talk about it but um is it a world that you're interested in it, it's something I'm very much interested in because I feel like that's as I was saying earlier you know it's for me it's like I want to like what's the next step you know and that seems like it would be like the logical 
next creative step to keep myself you know excited so yeah cool. i'm definitely interested in it sounds good thank you let's get mike over there hey man yeah. hey man thank you for coming um it's a technical question i guess um i kind of noticed that the most of producers are like um searching for a really analog sound and like um concentrating on like sound design and stuff and there are those producers like you for example or one of tricks point ever or fatima al yeah, yeah. who are more into like doing midi-esque almost yeah. cliche sounds yeah. um and i really like it actually can you tell me something about that is it about like nostalgia or i don't know it, it's, it was kind of a it was almost a mistake basically because i bought i bought a particular keyboard which had all these sounds in it and it was the first like proper like workstation keyboard that I, I ever owned but it just happened to have all these sounds on it and f I guess from liking a lot of 80s music that had these sounds in it I was like fuck it I'm gonna I'm gonna use them like I don't need I don't need like some crazy like modern polysynth I just fucking use some general MIDI sounds because you know it's it sounds good to my it's ears, amazing. and it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't really like a, a a deliberate deliberate sort of creative thing to be like oh I'm gonna reference this genre or this this era. It was just like sounds good to me. So. Do you think it kind of like improves your songwriting because you the technical limitation is like. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, because I th I feel like, you know, I do, and this will probably piss a lot of people off in here, but I, you know, I do own a bunch of, um, you know, what you would call real synthesizers or whatever, and I find myself rather than, you know, coming up with little riffs and stuff, I find myself tweaking and stuff more and like fucking around with stuff which is sometimes I feel can take away from the from the end result a little bit rather than just being really direct with like one sound you know. all right and one more question uh I'm actually very good friends with Mami Komoto oh, yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for her I probably wouldn't be here and um well, she that's the same for me actually yeah. <laughs> and she uh did so sounds for your video game right yes she did. <laughs> is that crazy <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, more yeah. video game um, so, will there ever be another Hatsumawak video game? There, I think there's one that that's being made at the moment. I need to actually. Like, um, thank you for reminding me. But <laughs> no probably, problem, man. <laughs> I need to chase that out. Um, but yeah, no, there there will be. Yeah. Uh, thank you, man. Thanks. Any more questions? One more over here. Can we get a mic over there somewhere? Hi. Um, I know how much. <laughs> <laughs> this is my sister, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I know how much of your work has been informed by working really closely with people who are your genuine friends. So, what do you think are some of the benefits and the drawbacks of working professionally and touring with people who you are really good mates with? Yes. Okay. Very good question. That's a good question. You should be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you have done this whole fucking thing. Um, Thanks, Ross. No, no, I'm saying <laughs> no, should have been in my position. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's another thing is um, you know touring with touring like, to go back to to uh, to your question. Yeah, um, touring with a group of people who maybe have just been suggested by your management or something like, oh, this is a good tour manager. This is a good, you know, whatever to have on the road. Like that can sometimes take it out of you because you're you you're working with people on 
something that which should be a really close knit thing, but you don't know each other. And when there's like, you know, really tight changeovers at like a festival or you need to be at soundcheck for a certain time you don't even really know one another it's like that there can be tensions there whereas if you're like traveling with a group of friends um it the dynamic just improves and that's what i was i said earlier as well about just having a tight team that and staying on top of them and and making sure everything everything that like gels properly and it's important i mean i've had to do it myself this year in terms of the the touring that i've been doing i've had to to you know swap out a couple of people because of like you don't necessarily gel with other people that are in the in the touring party and that kind of thing so i think it's i think it's very important great answer <laughs> Any more questions today? No. Okay. Well, please. Oh, one more. One more. Uh, so, uh, first, thank you for your music and the lecture. Um, you recently broke the world record, I think, for the longest rap track. Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is amazing. It's essentially <laughs> one song that's an entire album, and it features uh, I think twenty some odd rappers. Yeah. Um, and the beat progresses with the different rappers, and I was just wondering if you had made it as sort of like different iterations of the same song and then you decided to turn it into this mega long song? And did you have certain parts of the track that you had rappers in mind for? Because some of the beats tend to match the rapper's styles really, yeah, really I mean, perfectly, so. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the really intricate parts of that were done by, I don't know if you know S-Type. Um, he helped out a lot with that as well um but because obviously like you don't want to hear the same fucking loop for 42 minutes or whatever you know what i mean but um no it was it was uh yeah i'm like it wasn't they weren't separate tracks it was like done with the with the idea of no, we're gonna we're gonna make the we're gonna make the longest <laughs> we're gonna make the longest track. And it's, I don't know where the f the f the the concept of it came from really, but uh, like you know, it was a great experience to get to work with people, especially like you know. Uh, I like the fact that we could bring together like classic artists with you know m m contemporary modern artists like for example having mob deep on it but also having Ashley Bronson or something like that you know what I mean um and bringing everyone together into the one project thank you please join me in saying thank you very much Mr Hudson Mohawk. thank you everyone thank you Ross thanks a lot man <laughs>